so my name is Jeff Giboney. Uh This is Peter Esden Temsky, uh, Pranay Sinha, and Chris Ferret. Um, so we're going to be giving a talk on the Paparazzi platform, which is uh, an open source uh, UAV, so unmanned aerial vehicle, unmanned aerial system, uh, which has both software and, and hardware. Um, so uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, we uh, actually last year started a company called Transition Robotics, uh, which we uh, to uh, design and sell open source uh, hardware paparazzi compatible electronics as well as uh, aircraft, some of which we have here on the on the uh, podium and uh, we believe in the in the um, you know selling selling the atoms giving away the bits so uh, working with the open source community and uh, we ourselves are active uh, developers in the paparazzi community um, so some of you may have seen uh, chris anderson 's talk on Friday on uh, titled drones. Um, and uh, I think he really captured, so we, we in the UAV community need to kind of recapture the, or, or reclaim the word drone, uh, because in the public perception, a drone is something like this. So a, a, a militarized, uh, huge vehicle, a reaper, a predator, um, it's scary. It's, uh, you know, it's aimed, at, it's aimed at me, it's looking at me. I don't know who, who's on the other end of that, of that camera of, or, or of that weapon. Um, but, but to hackers and to nerds and, and, and makers, we think, Drones should really be more like this. They're they're interesting. They're fun. Uh, they're they're useful. Um, they're great to do uh, all sorts of research with. Um, you can you may think of uh, multi-copters uh, or or fixed-wing airplanes. Um, <clears throat> we ourselves uh, met at a company called Joby Energy, which uh, pr which was working on an area called airborne uh, wind. Uh, generation. So the, the basic premise was instead of having a big tower with a wind turbine on it, you have uh, an, a kite, a, a rigid kite attached at the other end of a tether, um, which flies in circles. And on, and on this uh, rigid wing, you have electric motors, which you can either feed power into to fly the kite up into the air, or pull, and then once the wind has taken it, you can pull power out and generate electricity that way. So that uh, we had a need for uh, unusual aircraft. So vertical takeoff and landing, they needed to be able to transition to forward flight, um, both fly free and on, a, on the end of a string, um, and a lot of unusual um, aircraft plan forms. Um, so when we were getting started, we considered a lot of different UAV platforms. Um, we needed something that was basically commercial grade, but uh, in full featured, uh, but we had to have full access to the hardware and the software. So uh, most, since most commercial systems are, are basically black boxes, uh, that didn't work for us, and so we uh, looked in the um, open open source uh, arena, and uh, but we also had to have something that was already working, already flying, um, and that had support for you know a broad range of, of different hardware and and, uh, and sensors. And making the problem worse was our boss's favorite phrase was, "Is it ready to fly? Is it ready to fly?" So we needed something that was uh, that was conducive to very rapid R and D cycles that let us bring up new aircraft quickly. So just an example of one of the aircrafts uh, that Joby Energy created. Uh, here's an eight rotor uh, vehicle. So it has uh, eight rotors, four elevons, um, a bunch of sensors. It's doing um, a, a 12 state Kalman estimation to figure out where it is, and it's capable of both hovering flight and forward flight um, in obviously very acrobatic modes, which is what you would need in order to generate uh, power from the wind on the end of a string. You have to basically sit there and do loops all the time. So the system that we ended up using uh, is called uh, Paparazzi, and we found that it, uh, it really met our needs, and so that's the subject of our, of our talk today. So I'll uh, hand it over to Peter, who can go through some of the history of Paparazzi. Yeah, so hi, everyone, from me too. Uh, so uh, I will talk a little bit about the history of Paparazzi, how it came about, and uh, when it started, and uh, who did that, um, because I think it's, uh, it's an interesting um, uh, path that it took. Uh, it got started uh, uh, quite early. It, is, uh, it was started in 2003 uh, by two uh, researchers from uh, uh, Ecole Nationale de l'Aviation Civile, ENAC, uh, in Toulouse in France. Um, these two guys uh, wanted to uh, compete in a competition uh, that uh, in, was held in Toulouse in their spare time, uh, and uh, they started developing a, a platform that uh, could compete and uh, solve the mission. So 
uh, these guys uh, um, took this stuff, won the competition, ca came next year, won the competition again and said like, okay, so we seem to have something really cool and what do we do with it? So the straightforward thing as researchers was, ah, let's release it and be the first open source uh, UAV platform. And, uh, and this is how, how it all started. And uh, over the years, uh, the, uh, the community grew, the uh, researchers that were using that platform for competing in competitions uh, also grew. Uh, so two years after they competed in the first competition, they had five teams running on their system and competing in the competitions. So um, by now, the community um, um, is uh, about uh, 60 active developers uh, committing patches into the system. And uh, they are all spread all over the world. That's not a um, very central community. Like some, some projects may be like more Europe, some uh, more US. This is over 18 countries and we are just counting new ones that are coming in. Um, the code base by now is uh, about 160,000 lines of code, uh, of which 75% is uh, ANSI C. Uh, besides, um, of course, hobbyists started using that platform too, uh, besides researchers, but um, the interesting part is like, because the researchers are uh, working on the project uh, a lot, they are um, infusing and giving back a lot of like really nice algorithms and solutions for because they have to solve their missions and because they have like challenges that they are competing at at the at the very uh, forefront of uh, civil uh, UAV systems. Uh, there is quite a list of uh, different universities involved: um, Adelaide, uh, Stanford, TU Delft, and so on and so forth. Of course. Uh, Again, an additional thing that is also happening because the system is uh, not started quite a while ago and uh, had time to uh, be quite stable, it is also used in uh, commercial applications. Like for example, there is a company called Delta Drone that is using the system and several others that are uh, selling commercial grade uh, UAV system based on paparazzi. Uh, the community, because it's uh, quite big and uh, um, it's all open source and everyone shares, we have uh, a really good wiki with a lot of documentation. There are thousands of uh, uh, wiki pages describing different aspects of the system, describing the controllers, describing like really in-depth stuff as well as introduction how to get started with the system. So I will hand off to Pranay to talk a little bit about the uh, software, software um, in Paparazzi. Thanks. As we said, uh, thank you. <laughs> so we have uh, both the software and hardware which is open source uh, within Paparazzi. So a quick overview of the software. Uh, we, uh, the software supports both fixed wing and uh, vertical takeoff and landing systems, so multi-rotors, helicopters, you know, there's traditional quads, octos, any number of propellers and actuators, really, uh, and transitioning vehicles. So you can la take off and land vertically, tilt your engines or tilt your wing and uh, go forward into, uh, you know, high speed, uh, high efficiency on wing flight. Uh, the platform is very well supported on Linux and uh, Mac OS X. We have partial Windows support coming in, but, you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> Also, uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is a software-in-the-loop simulator. So basically, any new flight code that gets committed, you can run within a simulator on an airframe, and so you'd know, you can predict how that will work in the real world. And the reason we did that was, uh, well, this little flight test that we had back at... Uh, uh, when you were. Oh, hold on. What the fuck? <laughs> fuck! Fuck! So essentially what that was, uh, <laughs> so essentially what that was, was a sign error. The, what you saw there was uh, the aircraft being flown under an old control mode and being switched into the new control mode after which the person who wrote the program actually you know, freaked out because the vehicle uh, went into positive feedback on pitch, rotated about a hundred, uh, or sorry, a thousand degrees a second, and actually, you know, tore itself to bits because of G-loading. 
So, you know, after that we said, well, better implement uh, uh, a simulator to uh, prevent these uh, high cost losses during testing, which is, it, which is really nice if you're uh, using a software of this nature to uh, work on really different new types of vehicles rather than the traditional quads or a traditional plane. So, you know, what is this software made up of? The software itself is an agent-based system. So every little piece is an agent in itself. For example, there's an aircraft agent or an aircraft module, which is uh, where all the flight software actually runs on hardware in the system. But you can also replace that with the simulator module in case you want to test it out first. And then there's a wireless link, which uh, can be of several different types. You can use Wi-Fi, XB. Uh, you can use a direct RC link, depending on what exactly it is that you're trying to do. Uh, and then the wireless links all connect to this IV bus layer on the ground, which allows you to use a multiple, uh, you know, use multiple ground station laptops or computers, and it allows you to control multiple aircraft in the air at the same time, get telemetry from them, monitor health status. And uh, we also have a server. Uh, you can actually plug in a server, so uh, you can log all your telemetry from the aircraft, from multiple aircraft, uh, for future use. And one of the interesting things about this kind of uh, distributed network is that uh, you can control UAVs from anywhere. Back in uh, 26 uh, C3, uh, a couple of the main, uh, one, a couple of the core developers for Paparazzi, Antoine and uh, Martin Mueller, uh, they were in Berlin attending the camp, and uh, they actually controlled a vehicle simultaneously in France and, and another one in Germany over uh, basically a VPN link. So they were just sitting there, you know, punching commands into their computers, and remotely these aircraft were just flying just based on uh, commands transmitted to them uh, via a Wi-Fi link uh, from ground stations, uh, and everything was being commanded over the internet. So that really makes it really powerful in case you want to do research uh, or fly vehicles in, uh, you know, in a swarm or do it uh, in a partnership or you know, cover more ground. So basically, that's the, you know, uh, that's the overview. So this is the ground station for uh, the paparazzi system. Uh, it can pull map data from Google Maps, for example, or OpenStreetMaps, or Bing. So you have, uh, based on your GPS track, an accurate view of the ground over which the aircraft is flying. Uh, you can put in waypoints and blocks uh, for complex flight paths, so you can do zigzags, you can do loiters, you can do spirals, you can do climbs and descents, all of which you can program beforehand and then change on the fly. So suppose you have 10 different waypoints, you can move them around and tell the aircraft to go to one or the other and behave in a certain way once it gets to that point. So just loiter or do a zigzag or uh, you know, do uh, an increasing spiral to cover uh, you know, more ground, uh, take video footage, anything you want. So it's very, very flexible. And the way it's all set up is that we have these top-level XML files where you can change small, uh, you know, just single lines and reconfigure the ground station, for example, to look differently. Uh, also, if you notice that little green corner in the bottom, all that, that has all the information that's coming down from the aircraft, so attitude, altitude, uh, battery monitoring, anything that you need. So one quick glance will tell you exactly what the aircraft is up to and what the status is. So let's talk about the uh, airborne segment a little bit. That is also very, very modular. So for example, you'll have control system blocks, so you can plug in different kinds of controllers. Uh, you have different estimator modules. You can even do th simple things like uh, blink LEDs in a certain manner. Uh, Chris, could you just turn on that uh, vehicle? So, uh, you know, even simple things like that, which are, uh, which are fun to do. It's easy to drop in because it's all modular and all uh, connects over a very standard interface. Then also we support a very large multitude of sensors and actuators. I think at last count uh, there were well over 70 uh, sensors and actuators that the paparazzi platform supports. So you can just plug in GPSs, IMUs. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. And like I said, we have this XML uh, top-level file system, which, uh, allows, which basically allows you to focus on the larger changes you want to make to the UAV. For example, if you want to add a motor or you want to add an extra set of aerodynamic surfaces with servos, you don't have to go deep into the control code and make the changes that are necessary. All you need to do is add the extra actuator to this top-level XML file, 
and uh, the code is actually auto-generated at the compi at compile time to work on the vehicle itself. So you don't have to, uh, this makes it really easy to develop new vehicles. And then again, uh, to put it simply, what do you really need in uh, you know, an unmanned aerial system flight code? Well, the vehicle needs to know where it is, what it's oriented as, it needs something to run the actuators, and basically, uh, you know, it needs a control system which tells the drivers that run the actuators what to do. So uh, basically, uh, Paparazzi has both fixed and floating point uh, algorithms for uh, pretty much everything that we fly. And this is so that if your hardware is able to support the floating point systems, you can run those. Or if you need a more clean, lightweight code, then you can run the fixed point uh, systems. Uh, our fixed wing controller code is formally proven, which means it's mathematically deterministic, so it's very, very reliable uh, when we're flying uh, fixed wing uh, missions, and we'll give you some examples of the kind of missions that uh, paparazzi fixed wing uh, vehicles have done. Um, and then uh, for the estimators to know which way you're pointed, really, we have complementary Kalman and extended Kalman filters already implemented, others coming online as we speak, because again, open source, lots of community input, uh, and we can, uh, uh, represent our attitude in Euler angles, quaternions, direction cosine matrices, anything that's appropriate for your mission, it's very easy to pick and choose. Uh, as far as control loops go, we use standard PID, we use PID with feed forward systems, and we have adaptive controllers coming online which are actually really, really interesting because uh, if something happens to your vehicle in flight, they are able to uh, compensate and this is actually an example of that. Uh, what you're about to see is that this aircraft will drop half of its wing in just about a uh, little bit. And what you see on the right-hand side is the ground station track. That's the wing gone. And as you see, there's a little bit of deviation from the flight path. The green is the required flight path. The yellow is the correct one. And now we also simulate an engine out scenario. So we've turned off one of the motors. And as you can see, the controller still manages to do it. And uh, as a test, we tried to fly this aircraft, a twin star. Uh, Martin Mueller tried to fly it by hand. And it's actually unflyable by hand. Uh, it's unflyable if you don't, don't use an adaptive controller, because it's a very different vehicle once you've lost half a wing and an engine, when it's meant to fly with two engines and you know, two wings. So uh, these are the things that make the system really, really powerful. So again, you know, it's a huge advantage to have a system that can do things like this. And then the software licensing, GPL3, free as in freedom, because again, why would you not? You get so much more input uh, and so much more fun when you get to work with so many people across the world. And uh, now I think we'll talk about the hardware side of things, and I'll switch back to Peter for that. All right, um, so it, it, as Prene already um, told you guys, it's uh, paparazzi in the software arena is very flexible, but uh, this uh, is similar with the hardware uh, side of things. Um, this system started out to uh, run like in the very beginning on an AVR at Mega. Um, this uh, got uh, basically the new hardware wasn't made uh, um, after a very short period because the requirements for the uh, algorithms that people wanted to run on it were, uh, were a little bit higher. So uh, basically LPC came on, uh, LPC uh, ARM7 TDMI, and uh, because uh, we, we had uh, the more powerful platform, basically we decided in 2010 that we can drop the support for the AVR. And the next generation of uh, hardware, um, we uh, added uh, um, ARM Cortex M3 uh, platforms that are a little bit faster, have a little bit more I.O., and, uh, um, and these are the two uh, stable platforms at the moment. And we are also working on the next, uh, next step uh, that is really like weeks away, more or less, or maybe a month, <laughs> uh, to add the Cortex-M4 uh, with, um, with uh, floating point support, uh, even faster CPU, more storage, and DSP com commands to be able to do even more sophisticated controls and more sophisticated software and do even cooler things uh, than, uh, than adaptive controllers that this, there, is, there is still a way to go. So because of the support, 
uh, we have uh, a lot of autopilots that were developed in the community for different missions, uh, um, and um, this is just a, a small excerpt of the different autopilots that are supported by Paparazzi. Um, and uh, on top you see um, uh, um, autopilots that are dedicated for fixed wings. Uh, then we have the booth in the left lower corner that is a dedicated uh, rotorcraft uh, um, controller. And, uh, and then we have uh, the Lisa L and Lisa M. These are uh, generic platforms that are meant to run uh, fixed wings as well as rotorcraft. And uh, Lisa L is a bigger version that has um, differential pressure sensor and mates with a um, Cortex A8 Gumsticks Overo um, um, computer on a uh, on a uh, on a module that uh, allows you to uh, interface with the uh, I.O. processor that is a Cortex-M3 and run, uh, for example, um, vision rec recognition and uh, communicate uh, and give commands to the uh, low-level processor for, uh, for the track that it has to fly to uh, fulfill the mission. You can also uh, write uh, different controllers and run them on the Alvero if you, if you wish. That uh, speeds up the development process uh, quite a lot. Lisa M is like the uh, generic uh, um, plug and play. You drop it in and uh, you, you get your, uh, your UAV running. Uh, has uh, eight uh, um, uh, connectors for servos uh, or PPM motor controllers. It has CAN interface. Uh, um, it has I2C for a little bit older uh, rotorcraft uh, motor controllers and stuff like that. It uh, also has um, um, IMU mounted on it. Um, is, I will uh, show you that uh, in the next slide. These are uh, some sensors, uh, and IMUs are uh, very nice for um, in systems that are moving fast, like for example uh, quadrocopters. But uh, for in fixed wing, um, IMUs uh, have are, are nice if you are flying in bad weather, for example. But the IR sensors are still a little bit older solution, but incredibly uh, robust. So uh, a lot of missions are still being flown with the IR sensors to measure the temperature difference between ground and uh, air. And uh, then you uh, have a definitive uh, um, um, response where, where the horizon is. And this is how you uh, calculate your attitude. It is very good for airplanes, a little bit too slow for rotorcraft. So that's why IMUs. Uh, so we have this IMUs that were developed in the, uh, in the community, a postage stamped Aspirin IMU, for example, 10 DOM uh, um, IMU, three gyros, three accelerometers, a magnetometer, and a pressure sensor on a, a two by uh, 1.5 centimeter uh, small postage stamp. This mounts on the Lisa M on the back just, just to have a really nice tight package. We also support a lot of other IMUs from third parties, um, and uh, we also support uh, GPSs. Um, we have some developed in the community, and uh, here a shameless plug to our friends from SwiftNav. They are developing a really awesome GPS that is a diversity RTK uh, GPS, completely open source, that will go into uh, uh, vehicles, and we can't wait to fly them because we will get a centimeter precision uh, um, uh, uh, data to fly our uh, uh, UAVs much more accurately than uh, it was ever possible before at a reasonable cost. So all the hardware is either GPL3 or uh, Creative Commons by, uh, um, by attribution, and so it is open hardware as well as open software, the whole project. So I will hand off to Chris to um, uh, show you guys a, a few example airframes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So here we have a few examples of some uh, unique fixed wing aircraft. On the left is the Dragon Slayer. It's a very small, uh, high speed, relatively high endurance aircraft uh, developed by uh, military flight systems. In the middle is the, UM, the UMARS. Uh, developed in Switzerland. It's an uh, inter-European uh, research platform for meteorology study. Uh, and on the far right is the uh, perching platform developed by Stanford. It uh, flies like a normal aircraft and then uh, lands on a wall, uh, all using the paparazzi system. Uh, here's a few rotary wing aircraft. The uh, UAV 2.0 is a, a rugged, rugged civilian UAV. Uh, 
uh, quadcopter. In the center is a uh, quadcopter with four variable pitch propellers, just like uh, helicopters. It's quite unique. And uh, on the far right is uh, Antoine's uh, VHEX. It's very good for top photography because it gives a clear view uh, between the propellers. You mount the camera center line and you don't see any propeller wash. Here we have uh, some more unique aircraft, uh, two transitioning vehicles. Uh, the first one is uh, what we have here on the table, uh, the Quatcha developed by us. Uh, it not only can fly like a helicopter, but transition onto the wing and fly like an airplane. Uh, and then on the right is uh, uh, Atmov. It's a uh, 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 derivative of the Quadra developed by Tew Delft, uh, competed in uh, UAV Forge Challenge and placed third. Uh, Pernay will go over that a little more later. But uh, here is a, an example. Uh, this is actually what the Quadra uses. Uh, it's a Lisa M with four motors and uh, four con motor controllers with two servos and uh, differential um, receivers with the uh, possibility of the use of a GPS. Uh, it also uses an XB for telemetry for live data feed back down to a ground station. Uh, so here we'll go back to Pernay to go over some specific missions. So like I told you earlier, uh, some missions that uh, Paparazzi has been used for. The fixed wing code, like I said, is very, very robust. That's what Paparazzi was originally designed to do. And one of the things that uh, they used a fixed wing Paparazzi vehicle for was a flight in Antarctica to uh, measure uh, atmospheric temperatures at various altitudes. Uh, and this was, uh, to our knowledge, the first civilian research uh, UAV that was actually that actually flew in Antarctica, and uh, basically it climbed to several hundred feet, got uh, excellent data from uh, various uh, atmospheric levels, and this was uh, actually a vehicle designed by one of the community members, Martin Mueller. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. Uh, very, very robust. No hardware or software failures, uh, despite the extreme weather. So that's pretty good. Um, also, if you attended Chris Anderson's talk, he was uh, talking about the use of UAVs for uh, agriculture, uh, you know, to monitor the land, to see where, uh, basically to see where the resources are, what kind of soil is present, what, uh, where irrigation is required, multitude of things. It's uh, probably really useful. Well, one of the missions that Paparazzi has also done is this uh, agricultural survey in Madagascar. Uh, and it was a multi-university project. And they wanted to study the ecosystem for agricultural uses later on or the feasibility of uh, preserving certain ecosystems and or replacing it with agricultural fields, depending. Um, and, you know, very extremely, uh, well, economically backward region of the world, so they didn't really have the resources to do a manned survey, so it had to be something cheap, reliable, uh, and something, uh, you know, small, like a UAV. Well, this paparazzi uh, airplane essentially surveyed over 4,000 hectares of uh, farm and grassland, took, you know, over 8,500 photographs in uh, multi-spectrums, uh, so near infrared as well as visible. And uh, it was probably one of the biggest missions, uh, biggest scientific missions flown uh, with paparazzi and probably one of the biggest civilian scientific missions that have been flown with uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, an amateur built UAV uh, flying this uh, software uh, and hardware uh, combination. Also some competitions, uh, like Peter said earlier, uh, the JDM-03 in Toulouse in France, that's Genesis, that's why, uh, that's where uh, Paparazzi began, that's why it was written up. Uh, DARPA UAV Forge, this, uh, just this year, earlier, uh, Paparazzi vehicle, uh, the Atmo, which is a quasha derivative uh, by TU Delft, uh, they placed third there. Uh, and IMAF 2012 and ENAC Rotocraft, they won the outdoor challenge. So, uh, plenty of success even in competitions for Paparazzi vehicles. So what we'll do next is shut up talking and uh, actually fly one of these vehicles uh, since uh, <laughs> because, well, why wouldn't you? And, you know, empty seats over there, so people in front rows, I, I, I don't know.
might need helmets or not. We'll see how it goes. Thank you, Chris. Awesome piloting job as usual. And I think that's all we have uh, for you today. Thanks very much. And uh, There's a microphone up here if you guys have questions. Uh, and then we can do Q&A in the other room as well. Yes. And if you want to check out the vehicles or the autopilots, by all means, come up, take a look. And thanks again for listening. Hope you had a great DEF CON. <laughs>